So what is really the root cause of all the problems in the world today? A lot of people will try to bring it down to a political system. Politics literally means, you know, politics come from polis. It literally means the management of cities, which means the management of the people living in cities. So all these political systems that we've heard about, nationalism, socialism, communism, um, you name it, they have something to do with how to organize a city, but all of them, all of them ignore the fact that perhaps the city itself is the root cause of all the problems. And no matter what system you think of, whether it be local or global or national, eventually you're going to end up having exact same problems over and over again, because you're never tackling the real problem. There are too many people in this world. I feel that everything we've been taught to believe about society is just one gigantic lie. And the biggest lie is society itself. In a society of millions and millions of people, we are supposed to have a better life. But it seems to me that the only reason that so many people ever joined together to live with each other wasn't because they enjoyed each other, wasn't because they liked to help each other out and to provide services to one another and to do trade, honest trade. No, the real reason people came living together was because some people are better at something than others. Some people are better at hunting, some people are better at growing crops, some people understand masonry better. And so it would make sense for us, if we lack those skills, to make sure that we live close to the people who do have those innate talents. And that's the foundation of society. That means society itself is not a positive thing, but a negative thing. People live together so that in case the neighbor catches a deer, we get to have some meat. Not because we're good at anything. I hope you understand my point that the reason why people live together in massive societies in big cities isn't because they like people, it's because they don't like people. They're afraid. They're afraid that someone else might actually get ahead Right? And so they don't want other people to get ahead. They want to make sure that all those people who on their own would have gotten ahead are tackled. You bring them down, you bring them to heel, and you tell them you're going to have to pay taxes from now on because you're going to have to live with us from now on. And that really is a sort of, that society itself is the first oppression. Once you join a society, you are automatically oppressed. If there's anything you're good at, it's going to be taxed. The people living around you are going to demand you surrender your skills and your talents or whatever you're good at for the good of society. But it doesn't benefit you. It only costs you. And the only reason you are still succeeding is because you are that talented. You are so good at something that even when they tax you 50% or 80% or 90%, you still manage to get ahead of others because you're so good. The fear that others might make it when most people won't. That fear drives society. Now you'd have to go all the way back to the foundation of society. When did this happen that we stopped living as families of related people in groups of no more than 10 or 12 people? The way the Neanderthals used to live in Europe, they were hunting parties. They hunted for their own meat. They rarely ate any greens, maybe as a laxative. But how did it transform that way? that we ended up living in far larger communities. They say that the early Homo sapiens who came out of Africa was living in groups of around 150 people. They make a whole social theory around it. This is the reason why you won't have more than 150 uh, familiar faces in your life throughout your life. It might not be the same 150 people, but it's about that size. And it means that the Homo sapiens model of living with more people replaced the, um, the more isolated model of the Neanderthals, at least in Europe. And what I want to say by that is that perhaps, perhaps the way Homo sapiens was living already, if the story is true, that the man who came out of Africa was already a weaker man with less skills because there were more people around him that he could depend upon, meaning if you are living with 150 people, you can specialize. You can over-specialize. You can get really good at this thing or one thing or the other thing, but you will no longer be any good at surviving in the wild on your own. Because you might be good at pottery and road making and so on and so forth, but you know nothing about how to catch a deer or how to grow crop 
and so on. You become completely dependent on other people providing these, for, these things for you. And so society becomes a sort of a scam, whereas I make a pot, which is basically a worthless thing, but I decorate it with nice paintings all around, and then I tell you it's worth three hours of your hunting time. And if you fall for that, you've been conned. For the same reason if you bought the iPhone because all the cool kids had one, you've been conned. You've overpaid for something that was worth only a, a fraction of its price to produce it. And this is how I believe all of society work, works. All of society is one giant scam. One of the reasons why we might want people to believe that they ought to all live in society, um, it's that every society has some kind of ultimate benefactors, families or individuals, groups or isolated people who figured out how to really take advantage of, of the society as a whole. Just the same way that shepherds found out a way to profit from a flock of sheep as a whole or a herd of cattle as a whole. You extract your taxes from them, which is the milk or the mutton or the, or the wool or the meat. And in the same way, people living in society are taxed. Now, we don't actually sell our milk. We don't actually sell our women's milk. Actually, we do. Women do sell their milk to other women who need it for their children. And of course, in the early days, about 5,000 years ago, in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, there were these cults where the people living in the city, say in the city of Ur, which had about 20,000 inhabitants in those days, which was one of the largest cities in the world 5,000 years ago, the people, the common people, they offered their food, their grain, their meat, their milk, they offered it to the temple, supposedly to the gods. But the gods of the city, of course, were actually the ruling family who didn't have to work. They lived off the offerings of their people, the daily offerings of their people, because somebody had to clean up the offerings every night, right? Right, so the rich people, the ruling family, took the offerings that were meant for the gods and ate them themselves. Societies have always been that way. There have always been, since the beginning of urban society, there have been people, ruling class families, ruling families, who have always exploited the human herd, right? Because what exactly, what exactly do shepherds offer their cattle? We offer them warm stables. You offer them medical care and so on and so forth. The exact same things we are offered when we join an urban society. This is hard, <clears throat> this is hard to grasp for anyone born into a, a society or a city. You never really realize that you as a citizen or a civilian are actually the cattle to someone else. And that there are actual shepherds who rule over you. Shepherds whom you never see because the dogs barking at you, the shepherd dog, the sheep dog barking at you, that's the media. The journalists and the politicians, the politician, that's the farmhand. The journalist is a sheep dog. They bark at you to keep you in check. And the politicians, they promise you all the well-being you want, as long as you comply and obey. See where I'm going? It's a farm, and we're living on it. Now, I have, I have this outrageous theory that the agriculturalists and the people began build, building cities because they settled, right? You settle down on farmland, you have a lot of food from your land in terms of cheap foods like grain, which is not good for you. It's not meat. Meat is good for you grains are not good for you but they feed a lot more people at a far lower cost it's far easier to produce so you can have a larger population you can exploit those people more so it is in the benefit of the ruling classes to have a lot of people working for them and since other ruling families elsewhere are founding their own cities and doing the same thing you're in a cold war competition for population you want your population to grow quicker than the others so my theory then is is that the agriculturalists and the urbanists did not replace the hunter-gatherers. Rather, the hunter-gatherers became the nobility of the cities. The hunters who hunted for animals became human hunters hunting for humans. And the gatherers taking the taxes, the fruits from the trees and the berries from the plants and the bushes, now they began taking 
uh, the labor from the people. So the gatherers became labor and tax collectors, and the hunters became uh, the military, but also the, the warrior nobility of societies. So hunter-gatherers didn't go away. Hunter-gatherers became the upper classes of agricultural and urban society, which makes perfect sense if you are someone born into a city and you are raised in a way where you're not allowed to be a hunter anymore because you have to make pots, right? Then very, very few people will retain that skill to hunt properly. Very few people nowadays can go hunting. It's a very expensive hobby. You have to buy all sorts of equipment. Yeah. There are few places you can go to in this world where hunting is allowed, where you can actually do wild hunting with a spear and run after a deer on your own or with a group to ambush one. There are few places in Europe you can do that. I don't I think you can do it in Poland. My point is, my point is, even though it seems as though the hunter-gatherer lifestyle has completely died out and that it was replaced with agriculture and urbanism, what really happened is that the hunter-gatherers, a very small minority of people, the people who retained that skill set and that way of thinking, that way of life, they simply became the kings and the gods of the lower-ranking agriculturalists and urbanists and the civilians which means that's the whole which means that this whole idea that all people are born equal that's something you would tell the sheep the sheep are all made equal because sheep who are all equal are equally easy to be shorn if all the slaves are equal it is far easier to diminish conflict among the slaves and so it's easier to rule over them. Same for citizens. If all the citizens are treated equally before a court of law, just the way you would have children fighting over a bowl of chips. You have civilians fighting over an income and a salary. Of course, if you give all of them the same, there'd be, a, there'd be less conflict. So equality is about conflict reduction. Inclusion is about getting more people to live in your society so that the rulers of that society benefit more. Diversity is about this fact that, well, uh, you can just wait for kids to be born in your city or why not just open your borders and haul in people from every direction of the wind, meaning people who speak different languages, people who look different, people who eat different things. You bring them all to the city, you're going to have diversity in your city. You're going to have to manage the diversity, meaning you're going to tell people you're all equal even though you look different and you speak different and you eat different and you're from different places and different history and different religions and different beliefs, but you're all equal. You have to tell them that to diminish conflict. So diversity, equality, inclusion, all about reducing the conflict among the sheep or at the same time increasing the profits of the ruling classes. These things, D-I-E, die, diversity, inclusion, equality, is a trick it's a scam and that brings me to another point a very important point that is what we are living through nowadays um, is the feminization of men and of boys why is it so so i tried to think of a reason that doesn't require there to be a massive conspiracy even though there is one uh, the thing is once you have billions of people as today living in cities worldwide in such cramped quarters there's going to be a lot of conflict especially if the boys become men with a lot of testosterone so this is the first thing you do you have to diminish the conflict by reducing the testosterone among the boys meaning prevent them from developing too much testosterone prevent them from becoming manly men so to speak so this is where we are at in our age in these densely packed urban areas there is just increasingly no room for manly aggressive men to try to conquer, to go, to seek a world or a life outside of the city, since especially the whole world is urbanizing. Northwestern Europe, uh, Northeast of America, you know, where New York is, New York area, LA area. Uh, there are places where almost all of the people have been herded to. So that now over half the people in the USA are living in a major city and over two thirds or three quarters of all the people in Europe are living in a major city. And in East Asia, it's probably getting even worse. So you get to a point where uh, massive cities like New York, Chicago, Washington area and so on and so forth, they merge into an even bigger urban conglomerate, 
a, a city of mega cities made up of tens of such big cities so that there is just no outside world anymore there's only the inner world of the urban world yeah the inner world of the urban world is all that remains there's no more natural world outside it which of course is the goal of the globalists is to turn the whole earth into one giant city ruled by uh, an extremely small club of people and again these people would be the hunter-gatherers you have to have a hunter-gatherer mindset to exploit other people you have to start regarding other people as prey as sheep as perhaps even vegetation vegetation if this is the matrix right people are locked up in those cocoons and the life energy sucked out of them that's vegetation so the way you look at other people if you look at other people as your equals you will always lose if you look at other people as though they're essentially food you win but of course there are consequences to this development so if we try to look ahead a little bit and see where things are going if we acknowledge that in the cities in the densely packed urban areas male testosterone is no longer desired because it creates too much conflict and society cannot function well if there's too much conflict so we're doing conflict reduction making boys into half boys into half men eventually perhaps into girls with all right you're creating a world where perhaps the majority of people will be women and only very few males will be kept on stock as stallions to inseminate everybody As bizarre as that sounds, we're actually doing that to the cows. If you walk past a meadow with cows, they're all females. Cows are females, the bulls are the males. You rarely see them, there aren't as many of them. Even though cows and bulls are born in about 50-50 ratio, just like people, males and females, 50-50, the, the bulls, the calves, they're killed off for meat. And only the females are allowed to grow into adulthood because they reproduce and they give milk. So while they are growing, you milk them. And when they get too old, then the females are also butchered for meat. My point is that from the perspective of the shepherds of humankind, of the very sort of people I believe who are in charge of this world, of the urban areas, it is in their benefit to get rid of the boys. It's in their benefit to create a herd of human females who are a lot easier to control. And you keep a few stallions at hand uh, to inseminate them, but that's it. Um, we are in the process, in the cities at least, in the urban world, we are in the process of slowly transforming humanity into a female-only species, namely a commercial human herd. Just like we have commercial cow herds and commercial sheep herds. It's commercial. <clears throat> so looking ahead though, if we accept that this is happening, the feminization of boys in the cities is, is happening almost naturally in order to reduce conflict. That means the urban areas are going to become extremely feminine while at the same time the men living outside of the cities in the countryside or those men who may have moved to the city recently but who have still retained a lot of the uh, rural agricultural strength those men, they will be a minority, but they will be the only men left. And what I mean to say by that is what happens when cities become populated by 90%, 95%, 99% females and or effeminate men, then what are the last remaining wild men living outside of the cities going to do? The answer is that there is a, a window of opportunity here to do something about it. There's a small window here for a few years, maybe a couple of decades, in which, if you plan it right, the testosterone-fueled male revolt may, in fact, successfully surround urban civilization and bring it down. We could de-urbanize the world and start over. So I mentioned the city of Ur, that city that was built 5,000 years ago with about 20,000 inhabitants. So one day, and this is recorded in the Lament of Ur, one day barbarians on horseback seemingly surrounded that city. It was a walled city. People fled inside the walls. The barbarians did not follow into the city, not yet. What they did was, 
if you read the lament of Ur, it seems as though they did something to the water. They cut off the water supply. People began to dehydrate. They cut off the food supply, the agricultural produce, and the, and the milk from the, from the cattle was no longer transported to the city. So they blocked off food and water and the roads to the city. And after just a few days of dehydration and starvation, then the barbarians made their move. They went into the city, and it is recorded in that Lament of Ur, that they smashed in people's skulls as though they were clay pots. So it can be done. Cities can be destroyed, especially if the population is weakened. If you cut off the supply lines to the cities and realize that cities themselves produce nothing of value at all whatsoever. Cities produce only human excrement. That's it. So I personally do not support to turn the whole world into a giant city. If you want to know something about what is happening to the Netherlands and, and Northern Belgium, we're, they're trying to turn this in, into what they call the tri-state city with a part of Germany attached to it as well. It should be a city with over 50 million inhabitants, a modern urban world where all of the wild nature that is left in the Netherlands is converted into a, a maintained park. They're going to do that to the whole world if we let them. And perhaps we do have that ability and the opportunity, if we seize it, to do something about it and stop the urbanization of the world and de-urbanize the world.